It's all right. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. <coughs> Take your screen off. Is, is this thing screen? Or? Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and sorry about the feedback. Um, for our next trick, well, these are our uh, blacklists um, where you put them in your spamd.conf, a very uh, straightforward um, uh, format here. Um, on FreeBSD and uh, FreeBSD is, is, is a it's a package you need to install, uh, and you actually need to well read a package message and do what it says. It needs a file descriptor file system for some reason. Um, and of course, you can tweak uh, uh, things like the. Um, um, the, um, the spam flags, the G flag is uh, the first number is number of, uh, minimum number of uh, minutes for retry. The next one is number of hours a grey listed entry lives. And the last one is number of hours a white listed entry lives. And this, this number is little more than one month. So your monthly password reminders will pass. Um, and um, you can um, you can do a few more evil tricks. Now the uh, yeah we already mentioned the uh, uh, connections from our our real mail servers, um, and uh, and I know that <coughs> if you're Henning broke na broke NAT in the in four seven four eight so but that's fixed so <laughs> uh, my, one of, actually one of my clients had a problem with uh, one of these <laughs> but we fixed that afterwards so um, now this is basically what it looks like uh, when a, when a spammer is uh, is connecting um, that address has never been valid and it's um, well. Here we managed just to um, to waste for only four seconds, which is quite a few minutes. Um, this is a very old one. Um, then riffing on. Um, here's another one that lasted for 32 minutes, but after a while we had somebody actually hang on for 12 hours. <laughs> so it's uh, it, these are quite rare. We tried to try the graphing, you know. How, how long people hang on, and uh, I just needed to uh, uh, set a roof at, at about a thousand seconds because they were. You can reasonably graph something at like uh, forty-two thousand seconds. But essentially, all the data is anyway in the three to three hundred uh, interval. But yeah, so it's it's a lot of fun to watch those um, uh, watch those uh, attempts happening now. I mentioned invalid addresses. Um, I think it was Bob who came up with the gray trapping. Um, gray trapping is um, like an extension of the uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the gray listing uh, technique. Uh, and what you do is, like I mentioned earlier, if you have like fish out of your reject logs. Somebody has tried to send spam with a the non-valid address in your domain. You fish that out of your reject log, and you put that into your spam DB and, uh, database as a great trap. So anybody who tries to deliver mail to that address gets added to your local blacklist and gets stared at for the next 24 minutes, uh, 24 hours. Um, I've been evil enough to start, well. Uh, over the years, I, uh, I have something like twenty-eight thousand odd addresses like that fished out of the out of my logs, and I I, ex uh, I export that uh, the resulting blacklist every hour. It's been uh, anything from a couple of hundred to roughly forty thousand, <laughs> uh, but it varies a lot. Uh, and um, the uh, 
slightly larger uh, list that gets generated in this way is um, um, uh, the UA, tra UA traps list uh, generated by uh, well, Bob used to work at uh, the University of Alberta. The UA traps uh, uh, tra trap list is still generated there. Typically, some temp tens of thousands of, uh, of addresses that try to deliver junk to non-existent uh, UOA addresses. Uh, you can supplement uh, your, uh, your tra uh, trapping with, with that, and you're, of course, welcome to, to use mine, uh, which is also in the slides. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, several things have happened with Spamd over the years. One is you can sync uh, sinks, uh, uh, gray lists, um, white lists uh, between several instances. Uh, there's also work going on um, with uh, BGP SPAMD, a slight abuse of BGP to, uh, to um, uh, exchange uh, white lists and black lists uh, via, via BGP. Uh, I think Peter Hessler is coming here later. Uh, anyway, he had, a, he had a nice presentation on that last year, I think. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, it's possible to uh, to um, participate in that network. Now, um, if you well, your boss's boyfriend uh, will probably uh, uh, probably not want to be uh, bogged down by SPAMD, and there are people who do not <coughs> uh, correspond to very often, or that for that matter, the Google problem, as we used to call it. Yes, they retry, but they have a large farm of uh, outgoing MXs, and they do not retry from the same address. Um, that can lead to problems if you're, you're, if you're small enough. If you're big enough, uh, you probably have these mail servers in your whitelist, any, in your automatically generated whitelist anyway. Uh, for the rest of us, uh, spam, no spam D, basically do not expose those uh, addresses uh, to the spam D. Um, we, uh, yeah, so basically SPAMD. SPAMD is a lot of fun, easy to set up, costs you basically nothing, will save you electricity, and um, uh, yeah, well, I've blogged a bit about it uh, at various times, so look up my blog if you're, uh, if you're interested. And there's also a graph somewhere in here uh, with the um, typical uh, how long they hang on and so forth. Um, next up, what's your suggestion? We're at... We have uh, lunch at one, is it? One or one fifteen? Uh, so we have one and a half, two hours to spend. Um, uh, uh, if you want to limit the number of uh, rooms in your Well, uh, one one thing you could do is well, you know, it really depends on what your requirements are. <laughs> you know, um, you could do s things like um, you your external firewall. Well, you you, you, c you could do something like um, well, say you have uh, logical groups of, uh, of rules that say apply to this interface or that interface. You could you know, chuck them into separate anchors, or for example, or or just include. Uh, use, use the include file uh, technique as one, one possibility. Um, then again, it's always, um, well, there, there is no silver bullet, really. <laughs> but uh, you, know, you uh, need to go back to, sp to specifications or, or your requirements, see wh wh where, you, where you can, can optimize. But there are well, tricks like, um, I did have a, at one point, a no. Uh, if you would have something like common criteria for um, uh, 
You might want to be looking at anchors. Um, Well, it's not necessarily. Uh, well, you could do something like something like this, where you um, say you have a uh, set of rules that only apply to a certain uh, certain interface, like this one. Um, you you lump them together uh, under common cr criteria, like like this. Um, could uh, well. It, it's it's one it's one way of grouping them anyway. But then, then again, if you uh, you're starting from the 2000 rule rule set, you probably have quite complex criteria to start with. Um, then again, look for look for logical groupings, uh, do uh, things like that. You want to um, then again, we we would really need to look into. Uh, your specific configuration to see whether it's something we can, we can optimize to. Well, it's hard to say something in general. <laughs> Well, um, well, the optimizer would be well. Any, anything that's in, well, you, are you on OpenBSD or FreeBSD? OpenBSD. Open oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, uh, no, there, there is no uh, table equivalent for ports. Uh, you, 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 but, but you, you could. Uh, well, the port, uh, port ranges are uh, are not exp expanded. They're actually actually encoded in the rules. You could use port ranges if you get, well, if your other other criteria are are equal. You use port ranges like that, that's possible. Uh, then again, that would be a oh, port range from to oh, larger than, smaller than, uh, not equal to. Uh, um, you might compress your rules with some like port ranges, but, um, but uh, then again, I, I would need to look at your rule sets to <laughs> to see see what's what possible. Then again, the, it's always uh, it's always useful to um, to load verbosely to see what actually gets loaded. And uh, once you well, once you start debugging, uh, you probably want to um, well. Let's uh, I forget whether I put that in the um, I forget whether I put that in the uh, in the slides here. It's definitely in the book that. Um, for debugging purposes, you will you can have log uh, a match rule that match log matches. So criteria whatever match match say your test host log matches. What that does is that it will log whatever uh, uh, whatever whatever rules are matched in the rule set. By the, by the traffic that matches your your uh, log matches uh, rule, uh, which is uh, becomes fairly interesting in, uh, in cases where well, 2,000 uh, rules and you don't know which one is matching. Well, log log matches is your <coughs> uh, is your friend. Uh, but then again, your you, you uh, your 2,000 rules probably came from a, a well, hopefully came from a specification. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, but then again, yeah. Well, port ranges is one thing, uh, and as, as Henning said, um, please optimize for readability. Performance is really taken care of anyway. Um,
So now, now what's next where we use the uh, We got one about one and a half hours, uh, and uh, I think it's still too many slides. Um, so what do you want to hear about? Um, Let's say I have a PS platform. Mm -hmm. What's the uh, the number of uh, packets making each each rule? Uh, what's uh, is there some way to do that? Well, uh, th there are several ways. Uh, uh, one would be uh, the uh, PF controlled VDSR, uh, which would uh, VDSR, yeah, uh, which would. Uh, uh, which will we'll dump your rule set with all these counters uh, in place. Uh, yeah. Uh, this would be a, an extremely simple rule set on this laptop. Yeah, it will we'll look something like this, uh, where you have the uh, number of packets. Oh, uh, yeah, well, this is the basically the, the default rule set, where you have number of evaluations, packets passed, bytes passed, and the number of active states, which is surprising. Oh, I have a practically a passive laptop. <laughs> but uh, uh, and then, then again, in your slightly longer rule set, each each rule will uh, expand like this. Uh, if you go to just one V, you will just get, you will get something. Oh, oh. yeah, well, well, this is the, uh, just a raw, raw um, uh, basically the loaded rule set. Used to be, there used to be a uh, difference between V, V and VD. Yeah. So anyway, now VSR will, will give you what you want. The other, the other way to, um, if you want, there are specific rules you want to keep track of. Uh, there is. Um, there's this trick, uh, labels. Um, So you um, you uh, say uh, if there's a specific traffic you want to keep, keep track of, but not others. Well, anything that matches, say, in this uh, uh, this um, example here, uh, to and from whatever the email server is, and um, you would uh, well uh, again the PFDS VSR would. Um <coughs> It will give you the uh, the output, but you can also do something like uh, well, PF control uh, minus VSL, which dumps the the number the uh, the data for the for the for, for the label. And this is you know the if you want to you, you want to want to script it and feed it to your database or whatever. This this is what you want to do. Um, and um, so yeah, I guess that's roughly. According to the question, um, yeah, well, uh, there used to be PF top. There are also um, uh, actually uh, on OpenBSD there, there's Sysdat rules. Uh, that, uh, or Sysdat, uh, Sysdat, uh, yeah. Uh, Sysdat and also a number of things. Uh, this is the uh, Sysdat view of the state table on this on this uh, uh, this laptop. Yeah. So uh, let's see if we can fit it in here. Yeah, they fit. So uh, this, is, this is a live view or updated every second or so uh, of the of your state table. Uh, P 
PF, this is what PF top does in all your op operating systems. Uh, Sysdat has a number of other uh, number of other views that are interesting as well. This is the uh, oh, anyway. Uh, Sysdat on the OpenBSD is a lot more a uh, lot more powerful than uh, on other BSDs. Um, now again, for uh, if you want to track um, uh, if you want to track all the tra all the traffic, uh, the pro um, you probably want something like PFlow. Again, you want OpenBSD 4.5 or or newer. I I forgot to check whether PFlow actually made it into um, into FreeBSD. I don't think so. Yeah, so yeah, but anyway, uh, it's uh, well. Um, on the, on yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, PFLOW. Uh, 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 one of one of the one of the good things that came out of Cisco was the NetFlow uh, specification. Uh, basically, what you record about uh, uh, your traffic is well, any connection is. A is uh, consists of two flows, one in, one in each direction. Each one has a uh, source and destination address, uh, uh, starting end time, num number of bytes, number of packets, uh, protocol. Record that, and for each, um, so you have all the interesting data about a, about a, about a connection, uh, metadata in what is it, 100 and or maybe 200 bytes. So uh, basically, if all you want to want to know is the metadata. Uh, this is a very, very cheap way of, of uh, recording it. And there are a number of, um, um, well, you, uh, on, um, you set up a sensor like this, um, where you can, uh, well, again, if there are only specific rules that, uh, that interest you, you set up the uh, exports uh, or records uh, uh, data in the PFLOW format, or if you want to set, set it as a state default, you can do that. Again, this is uh, probably not in FreeBSD yet. And well, if before you actually get to record anything, you need to uh, create the, uh, uh, configure the, uh, the PFLOW uh, interface. And what, what it needs is the flow source and where to send the data. Uh, which is where your collector is. Uh, there are a number of collectors. Uh, my favorite, and I believe several other people's, uh, is uh, NFSEN, uh, based on NFDump. Uh, it's basically package add NFSEN, read, read or read me, and within minutes you have nice graphs of your, of your PFLOW data. And uh, you can drill down, so um, that's, n that's another very, very nice interface for you know, learning what, what your network actually does. Uh, I, yeah, I think that's, yeah. Um, if, you're, if you want to look into uh, NetFlow uh, in general, uh, Michael Lucas has a very nice book called Network Flow Analysis out. He, I think he, he was not aware of uh, NFSEN when he wrote it because he um, he wrote the book about the uh, uh, flow tools, um, which is well, but it's, it's a very useful book. Michael writes great uh, great books, so please buy all of them. <laughs> um, for uh, well, for FreeBSD and for other, there are s there are several uh, NetFlow collectors, uh, PFFlowD. Uh, written by Daniel Miller is, uh, is a fairly useful one, um, which will, um, yeah, it will do what you want if you don't have, a, uh, if you don't have a PFLOW. Um, again, um, yes, what's the other, th what's the next thing we, we, we riff off? Uh, do we, Go back to the menu. No, that's not going to work. Um, I was thinking, uh, 
Anyone for traffic, traffic shaping? Well, um, oh, there are, um, oh, where to start? Well, in, in general, a cart doesn't do much damage to your own set, but uh, there are things to be aware of. Um, um, to the extent that traffic originates uh, at the CARP, CARP hosts, they, it will have the source address of that host, probably not the, the CARP interface. Uh, that's a thing to keep in mind. Um, then again, uh, the, uh, whenever the CARP interface bounces between the hosts, uh, that's... Uh, Uh, well, that's, that would typically be that the, the, the CARP interface uh, address is something like your, your default gateway for, for other hosts. Um, then again, keep, keep in mind that the, the rule set needs to, uh, probably needs to pass, or at least treat traffic that uh, has the, the physical host's uh, address uh, appropriately. Um, the uh, stuff like the CARP announcements will go out with the real, <laughs> um, uh, re real address, not the, the virtual one. Um, but for your general purpose traffic, well, uh, CARP, CARP is intended to be as invisible as possible. <laughs> so, um, um, so, it, well, you, you need to uh, compensate for the fact that you will probably have more addresses uh, involved in well, source and destination of traffic involving the, uh, your, your carved hosts. Uh, so you may, um, yeah, you, 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 might, you may need to work that into a rule set, say, uh, um, no, well, of course, so something like the, the first rule here for, for ac your actual CARP traffic to, to pass, um, your, um, uh, and you may want to in include even, say, a table or a list of addresses that uh, should be able to, to pass CARP traffic. Um, uh, other than that, um, there is, well, it, um, take care of the of, of CARP and PFSync to, to actually pass. Other than that, it's, it should be, I say it should be uh, almost invisible. I think you probably have more stories better than mine. But <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then again, you uh, well, stuff like um, there are, of course, uh, as you're probably aware, there are the, the, the risk traffic that's not really useful to uh, to sync across, like like in this example, SSH into the to the specific uh, host. Well, the context gets lost when it's uh, failed over anyway. So <laughs> there's stuff you can just just throw away. Um, well, again, for, for best practice purposes, well, um, your group of uh, CARPT hosts will hopefully be identical hardware-wise. Uh, Otherwise, you, well, you might actually do workarounds with, with interface groups to filter on the interface groups and get, get, get away with physical non-identical CARPT. Hosts, 
Yeah, let, let's say that's a, that's a valid trick. If you really, uh, if you really can't get identical boxes, interface interface groups are your friend. <laughs> that's prob probably the. Uh, yeah, the bit. Yes, they're they're your friend anyway. So fil filtering on inter interface groups. Uh, hang on. Uh, you uh, set them up with uh, um, you know, you, you if config them in. That's like something like this. Uh, if config, you know, and I believe uh, it, it originated in OpenBSD. I believe it made it made it into FreeBSD eventually. Um, extremely useful. Uh, as Henning says here, it's uh, it's possible to have a group with only one member, uh, and uh, if you take a look at your if config output, at least in OpenBSD, uh, you will have something like um, yes, my uh, wireless interface is in the group WLAN. Uh, this this one uh, has my default route, so it's in the egress group. Um, and uh, there are a few uh, default groups, like while well, the PF log interfaces has the, uh, has the PF log group, but you can define your your own, and you can have an arbitrary number of interfaces in them, as long as they have they have something in common. It makes sense. So, um, um, which is uh, uh, a num uh, actually a number of man page. Uh, uh, examples as well as I believe some in the in my presentation or in the book is uh, you typically filter on egress, which is well, makes sense. Your your uh, the default route interface, which is probably if you're a, if you're a firewall, that's probably the inter interesting uh, at least one of the interesting places to filter. <laughs> so so. Um, that's probably the the, uh, the, uh, the best tip you uh, you will get. And um, now for um, Practical um, traffic shaping thing, if you're interested. Um, an experiment that lasted 15 years was all Q. Uh, and um, it came out of a research paper um, in, yeah, well, it's late 90s uh, research paper. Yeah, and it was finally. Um, it was a good paper, uh, it was f uh, and basically they were exploring uh, how to shape traffic, and they came up with a number of um, uh, number of um, uh, algorithms. Uh, not all of them were ever implemented, but somewhere in the uh, in the the old world of old Q, we had basically three of them. Um, Henning here started uh, replacing that because the experiment was over at one, one point. <laughs> yeah, so. So, um, but anyway, the, the teaser was in OpenBSD 5.0, uh, where I guess I'm getting ahead of myself a little, but uh, if you know, if, uh, you can. Um, the basic always on priorities, which is exclusive to, to OpenBSD, where you have uh, priorities zero through seven. Uh, in general, um, default to uh, a sensible value of three, but you can tweak them and. Um, 
um, what you could uh, uh, with uh, a rule that matches um, a specific traffic, you can set two different priorities, basically to to <coughs> to get your your axe uh, tra uh, transferred. Um, so uh, your 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 actual data doesn't need to wait quite as long for the first in first out. Um, yeah, on the, well, this, this is <coughs> well, when on the on low uh, low bandwidth uh, or high latency links, this uh, this helps you a lot because well, default default uh, queuing. Well, if there is no queuing enabled, uh, everything has to wait in line, first in first out. The thing is, the way TCP works is well, you s keep sending, but you will. Uh, Expect an act back that oh yeah we actually receive this stuff otherwise it will resend and that will clog uh, clog up your uh, modem your dial-up line fairly quickly <coughs> so um, there was this trick that was uh, described in a uh, nice little article by uh, Daniel Hotmeyer who used to be a main PF uh, developer where he uh, used Alt Q for <coughs> just to set up uh, two uh, uh, system of two priority queues. One with the high priority, one with the, with the default priority, uh, and basically the uh, uh, the acts which are low delay uh, uh, priority will skip ahead, um, and um, you can you can tweak those a little, uh, but ba basically just. Adding something like this ma match out on on egress uh, set with two priorities, you will on a on a uh, on a low bandwidth link you probably will will see a, a difference. Now for uh, the two the two values is uh, for well the, uh, the, uh, your 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 bulk traffic and your uh, your your high, higher priority traffic, uh, uh, well the the low uh, the toss low delay will will <coughs> be uh, uh, sent on the higher priority queue. Now uh, this um, this is the the syntax for the uh, for new queue, you know, queue main on some interface bandwidth number. Uh, which is well, actually, I should say number, and optionally, k uh, kilobits, megabits, or gigabits, uh, because a raw number is bits, <laughs> just bits. So, <coughs> yeah, so it will. Uh, so and uh, so that, that's your main queue, uh, your queues that are actually. Uh, Allocated traffic uh, will be sub queues that name their parent, and of course they receive a. Well, they, in most cases, they receive a, a defined uh, uh, amount of uh, bandwidth, and one of them needs to be uh, the default. Um, moving on to a relatively simple. Yes. Okay. Now, of course, one was using bandwidth. Well. Ask your ISP. <laughs> uh, there is always an overhead, uh, and um, in um, uh, well, in your raw Ethernet, is, that's probably somewhere in the single-digit digit percentage. Some ADSL implementations can steal something like twenty percent, but you will, um, if you get unpredictable results, uh, well, you probably set your uh, interface bandwidth too high, and. Um, in a typical in a typical setup, you will have your out, um, your um, your egress interface will probably be something like gigabit, but it, it's quite likely that it's not actually on a gigabit bandwidth, but it will still report uh, it has a gigabit. So th this is where you set your bandwidth to what you believe it is correct. If you set it too high, you will get strange results, but. Um, but you will, um, you, you might need to tune it. And anyway, what a lot of people forget is that for whatever your queue is, it can only be usefully shape 
rel um, relative to well the low lowest bandwidth in your single uh, uh, single path. So um, so uh, basically, if you if you flood flood too much, well packets will get dropped anyway. <laughs> So and that's that's the ba basic uh, basic of, uh, um, the basic truth of traffic shaping is that sooner or later you will start dropping packets. <laughs> so um, so then again, moving on to a uh, fixed bandwidth example, um, you have a uh, your ex uh, it could e equally uh, have said. Uh, egress here, you probably only have one default route uh, interface, um, bandwidth of 20 megabit. Meg megabit. Uh, actually, this is, yeah, this is something I used on my, my home gateway at some point. <laughs> so uh, uh, you have a default queue with the uh, defined bandwidth. Uh, FTP was once a favored protocol, UDP, various uh, and uh, something for web, something for SSH. And for SSH, we do the uh, vari uh, variation of the uh, priorities uh, trick here with one um, one queue for uh, called interactive, and one queue called bulk. Now the uh, we assign here using pass rules. But then again, if you're not already shaping and you're running OpenBSD, you probably just tag, uh, t tag a few uh, of the match rules for queue assignment on top of your rule set. Because, well, you probably have filtering in place and editing all your filtering rules gets old fast. <laughs> so um, if you already have a rule set in place and you want to do shaping, do it by, by match rules. There's something like this. Um, on the uh, a slightly more involved example, yes, this is um, uh, probably the more interesting thing. This is where what HFC, HFSC looks like in, in real life. Um, you have a YAM, uh, your, your root key here, uh, and one that is parent of several others, uh, but it has a uh, fairly flexible uh, allocation here that gets uh, sub-allocated to the queues that have a guaranteed minimum, maximum, um, and uh, perhaps the more interesting thing here is for for this queue we have uh, relatively low ba bandwidth. Uh, but it can have burst, burst activity for 300, 3,000 milliseconds. Here, uh, it will be, can be allocated this much. And, uh, well, of course, we always get back to spam V where we get one, um, just to be a little more evil to our, uh, to our spammers, uh, only one, one uh, K uh, allocated. Um, minimum zero uh, and a queue limit that well, basically you're, you can backlog up to 300 packets here, which is the max, I think. Um, problem with these small allocations is that you might actually end up giving them more because you're getting into conflict with the resolution for the timer that actually uh, measures this. So, um, um, but, uh, but then again, uh, assign whatever uh, whatever your traffic you have with the uh, you know, with match rules um, and uh, assign with a set queue and you'll uh, you'll be good. You should be able to watch your queues live with sysstat queues. Now I'm wondering whether I can get into my yes. Yeah, this is what it looks like. Uh, you can see that, uh, that, is that uh, well, as you can see, this is, uh, that's the exact uh, configuration uh, 
Crummel's Lights on my home gateway here, where we have, uh, we're not nice to spammers. And you can see the other ones. Uh, looks like my daughter has been surfing the web a lot lately. <laughs> so it's either her or the cats. <laughs> so, um, No, uh, like this is a, uh, a, uh, a live system. Um, well, you can get something like uh, oh, it's the peer control version. Uh, it refreshes every couple of seconds. Um, And we really would want a little more display to, to have, it, have it displayed properly. Uh, now, converting from old Q to um, yeah, this is uh, converting to to old Q from the um, from the old school. Um, well, yeah. In OpenBSD 5.5, you still have the option of running your old queue, um, old queue kill uh, uh, rule set. Uh, right. uh, that's probably because you're German. Old queue became old queue. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, for if you have a, a, an existing uh, old queue setup that's uh, uh, something like this, um, you will be able to, with a very quick search replace, uh, make this work on OpenBSD 5.5 as well. Uh, this this will just not load on OpenBSD 5.5. This will, uh, but you only have the one release to make make the uh, make the adjustment to to the new one because. Uh, Somebody in this room was too lazy to maintain two code bases. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, so it's, um, the, uh, the old queue is gone in 5.6. Five, in five, and um, yes, oh, uh, as I said on the slide, it's limited time only. Uh, well, OpenBSD 5.5 will stay supported for another six months. Uh, five, five, 5 will stay supported until 5.7 is out. So, yes, you have another six months, roughly. Oh, or it's seven. Well, I After that, well, you're on your own with old Q on uh, OpenBSD. And basically, you will, um, you will want to, to convert. Um, it's, uh, well, the new syntax is more readable. Uh, and uh, well, you can go by the old, old, old queue trick. I did that experimentally, but uh, on, a, on a few uh, uh, cases. But uh, anyway, the, well, the, the um, new queue is so much more readable. You will will want to uh, convert. Unfortunately, FreeBSD people do not have that option yet. Uh, I'm not sure whose arms we will need to twist, <laughs> but. <laughs> Now for our next tricks. Um, yes. Uh, Well, um, I mean, oh, the to the right software and want to connect through hmm. modern line, for example, and hmm. I make yeah. the time delay drop packet. Randomly. Well, uh, dropping packets you could do uh, pass or drop with probability. Yes, I uh, uh, So that's fairly easy. Uh, and of course, well, squeezing bandwidth. Well, you have the traffic shaping uh, in place. Um, latency. Cool. We don't have a trick for latency. Cool. Uh, and it would, 
Well, it would take some effort to create. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, I think Dom Dominet has that on FreeBSD, right? Uh, what? Dominet has that on FreeBSD, isn't it? Or uh, la latency simulation? Yeah. yeah. So, um, it's but, a additional framework for storage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then again, for, for dropping packets, well, you have the, uh, well, what I showed is the evil trick of uh, passing or dropping the probability. So, um, uh, but the latency we haven't really played with. Uh, there would be, might be evil ways to, no. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, divert to uh, s some user land daemon that does its evil tricks and diverts back. That might work. Well, then you wouldn't need to supply the daemon. <laughs> so. And this way you can make what you want with the mm, yeah. So Yeah. So, so basically, uh, use the divergent base, do whatever evil tricks you want, and uh, that will work. But then again, it's. Uh, it's a bit of work to actually write that demon, but, <laughs> but it might be an interesting project. Um, Is this what a demon to simulate traffic is <laughs> Yeah, well, for example. <laughs> um, and there's AD, yes. Uh, So, um, we've gotten through an amazing amount of material already. Um, now, we might want to... Um, for the service, that you have added, was there a demon or...? Uh, that's a, uh, actually a non-interactive shell. We can take a look at that. Um, what you do is um, you create users with the auth pf, the auth pf as, as their shell. Uh, and um, what happens, well, the way you use it is um, user SSHs in, and whatever is defined for well, that user or that group of users uh, gets loaded for uh, gets loaded. So basically, you, s you, you supply the rules for uh, for that uh, configuration. Um, so yeah, your basics you would need uh, to. Well, you need the table that has to has to have the name of pf uh, underscore users. You also need to have the anchor where of pf uh, inserts the rules, and well. From there, well, the sky's the limit, really. Um, something like, well, if you want something to uh, apply to everybody, you put it in the uh, um, uh, in the general uh, of pf .rules file. Uh, something like this. Well, anything for any, which would mean any, anybody who had it authenticated, uh, uh, well, any. Any IP address belonging to a user who authenticated uh, would have a traffic pass to your UDP services or and your and whatever whatever these macros stand for. Um, so this is your basic uh, example. Um, you could use something. Well, for uh, if you want to differentiate. Uh, for different users, you would have something like this, where you reference the user IP variable instead. Um, um, a variation on your basic. Yeah, anchor per user. Uh, no, the the uh, auth pf inserts in the uh, in the auth pf anchor, but the uh, you would you would need to write the 
the rules uh, for whatever uses you. Uh, It, it, well, the um, it would be the the uh, the IP address, well, uh, uh, the, uh, the IP address that the, the user uh, authenticated from. So, uh, if that's a NAT address for a large network, well, you may have a separate problem. But <laughs> yeah, you authenticated from there. So, um, um, let's see what we have here. Yeah, well, you have something like. Uh, um, yeah, you have uh, someone like uh, a user named Peter who should be severely limited here. Basically, this is um, let's actually take it from the home network as well, which is um, you know, this user is allowed to contact the web interface of our music server, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and not much else. Uh, and the other one, well, anyone who comes from an open BSD. Uh, um, uh, open BSD machine is basically allows us to do anything. You know, <laughs> you should be nice to Open BSD users. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I haven't actually uh, tried to uh, to fool the uh, uh, the uh, OS on, uh, OS the, um, identification. It's supposed to be fairly. Solid, but well, again, uh, it would be would take a relatively smart attacker to to uh, exploit that. Uh, there is a favorite example of one who. Another use of the <coughs> I forget where it is. Well, here's an example for oh, somebody, <coughs> uh, actually Ronald Swartz, um, Merlin. Um, in the early days of, uh, of PF and Old Q, he uh, used this one for, well, during one of the uh, virus storms, well, lots of, well, lo lots of uh, crap came from Windows machines. He would set up a, his Old Q with something or other and a minimal Q for, let's say, mail from Windows machines. And uh, any anything that came from Windows machines to port 25 would be assigned to that queue. And I can't believe I didn't see this earlier. Only the huge difference in my load. So it's it's usable for that. Well, I think this possibly predates uh, SPAMD in a useful uh, uh, configuration. No, actually not. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, um, he may not have been uh, been aware of SPAMD. Uh, Realistic, but you can. It's fairly reliable uh, as long as you don't get too. Uh, no, nobody gets too uh, too smart at the other end. The uh, the OS detection, and um, and you can use it in the in, the, uh, in ways such as these. Uh, we had a, an example of. Um, Well, here we have a first first part of an example for uh, actually a friend of mine set up his um, uh, uh, yeah set up his uh, home gateway. Well, it's a totally open network, but anyone who had not uh, basically anyone who is not authenticated and tries to access the web was will be. Uh, redirected to a, a web server that says, well, you try to use my network, but I don't know you. Contact me. <laughs> <laughs> so, and 
uh, in principle, these 10 lines or so of configuration uh, at that web server, you could conceivably put something that accepts credit cards. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, for basically your uh, startup captain portal here. So then you're. That's all the other uh, all the, all the useful things. Um, touched on the troubleshooting your network. Um, I've seen several networks recently where I, well, I was not able to, to, uh, to ping back home to check for latency. Probably comes from uh, the, well, I think it was 1994, 1995, uh, the ping of death, a malformed ping packet, you know, a little uh, too big payload would uh, 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 would essentially kill the TCP stacks of uh, TCP IP stacks of several uh, well-known operating systems. Those bugs were fixed, but uh, your early advisory said, "Well, turn off. Well, do not pass ICMP." Problem is that ICMP. Yeah. So. So. Um, then again, uh, on, you know, some of these rules are, well, uh, if you want uh, ping to work and a number of other things to work, you probably want to pass at least some uh, ICMP. Now, uh, I've been in situations where I could not put that rule in there because, well, this reveals too much about your, well, could potentially reveal too much about your, uh, the structure of your internal network. So, you do something like, well, limit, um, li put some, some, uh, some kinds of limit on it. For example, you will define a number of uh, ICMP packet types to uh, be allowed to leave your network uh, from, uh, from your local network, and you, you will allow here certain ICMP types to your your egress interface, that's that's something I implemented somewhere, and they were happy that well, it will sort of work. Um, and again, for ping to work, echo rec is the one you need. And again, your pass rule will stay the same even if you uh, even if you um, uh, expand the uh, the micro trace route. A venerable trace route actually uh, uses UDP. Uh, on at least some Unixes, uh, the uh, several other mod modern operating systems, including, including I think recent Linuxes, uh, uh, use uh, uh, T um, ICMP Echo, and Microsoft definitely does. Uh, in you know, OpenBSD, you can specify a uh, few things to uh, to trace route. Um, and again. One of the reasons why you do not want to block ICMP is path MTU discovery. Like, well, send off your packets, well, whatever, uh, whatever size within your local links uh, 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 max tr transmission unit. If that, for some reason, is, that is too big somewhere on, uh, along, the uh, along the way, you will get the answer. Uh, ICMP reply, which destination reachable, Fragmentation needed, do not flag, fragment flag set. Okay, so you, for that connection, you will uh, uh, adjust the, uh, the MTU. This will not happen at all, of course, if you, uh, if you uh, block ICMP, like the uh, people who are scared by the uh, you know, ping of death. That's not what actually hmm? So uh, yeah, well, if you if you have keep states, uh, it, most of us will will piggyback. 
Um, and, um, well, you could do something like this to make sure everything uh, uh, go, uh, actually actually passes uh, read. Um, another thing, uh, mo most of your tra traffic will will piggyback on um, uh, on your uh, keep state anyway. Now, ICMP, um, you know, ICMP6, for IP uh, version 6, they do no, they no longer have ARP. So a lot of stuff passes over ICMP6 that uh, is important for stuff like uh, um, I, uh, IP version 6 auto configuration, finding out where your router is, um, and uh, stuff. Uh, so if you run uh, a reasonable sized IC, um, IP version 6 network, you probably want to uh, probably want to at least be aware that you may need to pass certain types of uh, ICMP6 through through your uh, through your gateways. You may or may not. Well, please l look into it. It uh, really depends on your local configuration and whatever you want to do with it. But s some of these uh, some of these have, have turned up in in the wild as quite quite useful. Um, but again, you can buy Henning a beer, and he will tell you why I, uh, 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 IP version six is broken anyway. So, <laughs> so um, and um, so, how are we for time? Okay, another half hour to go. What do we do? Um, Yeah, well, we can, we can do that. Now, um, actually, Wi-Fi is our Wi-Fi support isn't that hot anymore. You know, we don't have AC. Uh, we don't have N. It's a um, little. <laughs> but anyway, um, historically, um, there was this um, uh, one problem with, with wireless. Of course, is that well, anybody anybody can snoop you. In principle, it goes out of over the air waves, and well, so make it a little more, well, try some privacy they tried for, well, WEP, what they call wired equivalent privacy. And that always reminds me of your plastic pal that's fun to be with. Well, and, well. Seriously, if you have a highly secret traffic and you're sending it unencrypted over the wire, it's useless. Yes, because anyone who can. Well, uh, that assumes that you, uh, uh, well, uh, if, you, if your wires are exposed enough that people can tap them, yes. Uh, so. Yeah, so basically you probably need some. Uh, so some words, mm. if you're being responsible and your wire passes, you don't have to keep your wire open for any purpose. That's true. Uh, use, uh, use properly encrypted protocols and you're, you're that, that will probably do a lot more for your security uh, but any, any, anyway the well the uh, point is that the uh, web was broken fairly quickly uh, because it was uh, well they didn't actually have any cryptographer, cryptographers in their design committee uh, they found somebody who actually knew crypto for uh, WPA. Uh, but WPA was so over-engineered that it actually took several years for it to arrive in several free operating systems. Um, the only, well, uh, this site, uh, which is run by a University of Bergen professor, has um, a few good presentations about wireless uh, security. Uh, I tend to just refer to that. Uh, but anyway, setting up on, uh, on on OpenBSD at least, you know, it's uh, 
It's as simple as, well, something like this. Um, you check that you, your card is actually recognized. And then you set it up like any other interface. Well, here we have a, uh, I forget why it was 11B, probably just to demonstrate that we can actually be this specific uh, uh, in, the, in the last few years. So to, I've only really specified the uh, MediaOps host app, which make, makes this a, uh, an access point. Uh, skip the mode because it's not interesting. You may want to spe specify the channel. Uh, and this is a web. Uh, well, you, you, need, you need a network ID. And NW key means it's a web uh, uh, setup. And again, you configure it like any, uh, any other uh, interface. Now, now, now you got a, an access point. Uh, on FreeBSD, it's a little more involved. Um, because, well, at some point, I forget which version, but uh, there was a, a push to virtualize the, uh, the network stack in FreeBSD, and it led to several interesting consequences. So this is what I had to do to, to um, set up a free beast access point at one point. Uh, this, the, uh, you make sure the driver for your wireless card is actually loaded and you have the uh, several, several other uh, modules that also need to be loaded by your, um, your loader.conf. So you just won't get anywhere without that. Um, and then uh, in addition to whatever you put in your uh, well, it, I found the easiest way to, to configure a, uh, an open, a free BSD access point was to skip the um, uh, rc.conf. Or uh, this would normally you would normally be able to put, put this in your um, your um, rc.conf only for whatever crazy reason I couldn't get it to work until I isolated it into a start underscore if not interface name. I still haven't got a good explanation of why, but that's what worked for me. So that's what I put it in the in the um, presentation here. Again, you can uh, you have the create args, well, the physical interface. Well, you create the virtual interface. You uh, set up the uh, the physical interface. And the two come together to create a uh, interface that you can actually configure with something. Um, again, we probably need, didn't need to uh, specify the mode here, but you can. Um, and uh, after that, it gets well. If you want WPA, there is no way on on uh, FreeBSD to avoid host app D, uh, which is. Uh, Kind of bizarre, but this is, this is what it looks like. You, you, the physical interface uh, cre uh, created uh, roughly the, the same, but you need the stanza and your rc.conf to set, enable host FT because it won't start uh, otherwise. And you need to put a lot of goo in your host This is the this is the minimal uh, this is the minimal uh, configuration I uh, managed to get working. HostFD will be able, with a bit of prodding, to uh, uh, actually play with most of the WPA's uh, options. Uh, but I, I must admit, after getting this to work, I was so sick of it. I, I just thought, put this in the, in the book and in the, in the slides, and well, this will work. Now, if you want to do something, uh, otherwise, yeah, well, force start HostFD, and it will, it will load. And, um, you can play with a number of other. Uh, I think actually the the sample hostfd.conf is not is not bad documentation. It's just really really confusing. <laughs> so um, uh, so basically that's your uh, how to get started on on the FreeBSD. Um, and then again, yeah, WPA. Oh. This is WPA on, on OpenBSD, right? One line. 
this is well, this is uh, if you want uh, the uh, uh, well, the, the, the more um, uh, the more advanced options, uh, you will need to install a package called uh, WPA Supplicant, which is, uh, well, I, as I, well, I grew a little sick of it, so, <laughs> so I, uh, so it, yes, it is possible. Uh, now, again, it's fairly straightforward as long as you're, you're not least E. And of course, what happens to your to your rule set? Well, in most cases, well, in, in some cases, your uh, uh, the uh, uh, your access point will simply be well, it will be talking to that uh, to your network of wireless clients and your uh, and whatever your your upstream is. In that in that case, well, hang on, it's you configured. Like you would any other uh, other gateway for a uh, for a small network. Uh, in some cases, you you have made a very bad decision and added in a wireless interface to something that's already a, the um, uh, the gateway for a wired network. And in that case, well, you will need to do something like uh, well rules that also apply to the. Uh, to the wireless uh, interface, so treat it like any other interface. Uh, uh, and again, whatever policy you have, useful probably to do something like, well, to find a macro for it, and, uh, or even uh, include include that interface in a uh, in a relevant interface group, and uh, anything to make your uh, make your uh, config more readable. And of course, uh, AuthPF was originally written to uh, tame wireless networks. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, that's why this is the next slide in the uh, in the presentation here. Um, we have um, and then again for any uh, wireless networks when, once you get 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 past the uh, they can be a real hassle to uh, to configure properly with the uh, well depending on whether you for example the uh, well WPA can be a, a real bitch to, to, to configure properly uh, and um, you will find out uh, <coughs> fairly fairly quickly whether your your operating systems uh, developers have paid attention to all the needs of your device. <laughs> Sometimes, well, <coughs> uh, there have been shouting matches over those. <laughs> and uh, I would, uh, do we actually have anybody working specifically on uh, uh, concentrating on, on Wi-Fi these these days? Daniel left, so. <laughs> So that, that's kind of a sore, kind of a sore point, really, because uh, well, I I used to I used to build uh, OpenBSD access points uh, for people, and yeah, they were happy with them. I mean, they were I could administer them remotely, and everybody was happy. But then, uh, yeah, um, crap happens. Um, and we're. So we're still taking, s I think we've got something like 20, no, so something like half an hour to go. Um, any requests, any questions, any? Uh, I could go to the, uh, well, if there are no requests, um, 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 we could break early for lunch if you uh, if you want, uh, or we um, or I could do the uh, our um, yeah. Well, 
please. Any any questions? Any uh, you you probably you have the notes already, so you know roughly what a menu is, or we can improvise something. Um, We haven't really covered logging. That's probably one of the required things. Um, uh, PF logs and binary basically by copying packets and uh, exporting them to the uh, PF log interface. Um, in modern operating systems, it's possible to have several PF log interfaces. So you can uh, do something like we do in, in this slide here. I really need to do something about those uh, font sizes. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, what you do is <coughs> for well, you, you can you can log both past and blocked or uh, flat match matched packets. But um, um, most of my examples here have a, a pass log. You can have match log, and in this case, we also specify that we log to a specific. Uh, PF log interface. Um, typically, you would do uh, and the way to read uh, whatever uh, PF, uh, PF logs to the log interface, you do uh, you read it into clear text uh, via TCP dump. Something like this uh, command line here, which gives you reasonable uh, time, uh, resolution on your on your times and it's what um, uh, the, um, it also gives you the crucial, in crucial information which rule was matched. Uh, for deba debugging your rule set, you really, well, you can do straight TCP dump on your on your interface and see whatever passes there. But if you want to debug a rule set, well, whatever um, uh, whatever passed here, uh, second line here matched rule 27, which will ma <coughs> Which you will find out what it is by uh, PF control VSR. <laughs> so uh, uh, you want this information for for debugging, debugging purposes. Um, and uh, of course, if you well, you can TCP dump is your friend really. If you ha haven't read the man page, if you're at all involved in in, in network uh, uh, administration, and I assume you people are since you're here. Uh, if you haven't uh, spent some time with TCP dump already, please do read the man page. It's actually quite usable. I've been trying to talk uh, Michael Lucas into uh, uh, writing a TCP dump mastery book. Uh, I have been thinking of, of that as the, uh, the, uh, the other option, because, but that's a lot more work. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, I d and I don't get to heckle Michael for it. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, well, the speed of mastery might be a, might be a project um, once I've recovered from, uh, from the present point. Um, yeah, well, uh, another possible uh, book I wanted to write was the same email with OpenBSD, um, which is halfway written anyway. <laughs> so, so I... Um, um, now what you get is, uh, yes, well, again, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, if you, uh, once you read off the, uh, the PF log interface, you will get useful information like which rule actually matched. And you really, really want that information if you're, something is happening, but you don't know why that is. Um, would have something like uh, something like this. Now, uh, this one, I think is actually identical to what's in the book, uh, where you uh, set, set up something like this, match, yeah, match log matches. We mentioned this earlier. Um, you would, pr in practice, uh, you would probably be a lot more specific where if you would match 
uh, on say a tra uh, uh, traffic from a specific host, the one, uh, like your laptop you're testing with. And what this does is, well, it matches in one match on the uh, int if. That's probably this this rule. It says, okay, we match our match rule, but it also matches uh, something that blocks for whatever. But it's passed anyway because it matches a, a different uh, pass rule, and finally, the packet will eventually pass out on the external interface. Yes. Yes. So it's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I need to revise this slide then to actually have it. Yeah, yeah well, you know, then again, uh, TCP, uh, TCP, TCP of mastery or TCP to database your friend might be written, yes. <laughs> so, but anyway, for, uh, uh, then again, this is, this is functionality that's only in recent open these, these match matches was added a couple of releases back. Yeah, well, I thought it was more recent, but uh, no. Okay, so uh, so it, it came in. Yeah. Yeah. So, but anyway, for uh, for debugging purposes, this is uh, this is pure gold. So, um, and, and as you correctly observed, you, you the source address uh, uh, changes as it will in networks with NAT. So, uh, and without the. Uh, All right. Yeah, so yes. Just realize that we're in the first. Yeah. So, which means, yeah, well, it's, it's actually been uh, seven or eight releases then, but yeah. Well, time, time flies when you're having fun. So, um, so basically, the, you Match log matches is a uh, really powerful, uh, uh, powerful tool in your uh, in your tool set. Sorry, OpenBSD previously does not have it yet, but uh, well, we need to hack with somebody on the uh, this conference to actually get that ported properly. Um, another thing, uh, a, a common request is, well, how do we pipe this to syslog? Can we? Yes, we can. Um, something like. Either you just say pflog to dev null, or you just kill pflogd. Uh, I'm not sure which is the more useful one. Anyway, what you could do is, well, you s set up your syslog conf to actually receive something, uh, and in this example, uh, send it somewhere else. And the magic, all the magic is here, where you no hop a TCP dump. Uh, that actually reads the pflog uh, interface, feeds it to logger, and tags it with pf tag. Now, as you can probably imagine, this might generate a lot of data. Uh, so I'm not saying I'm I'm not recommending you do this, but if you need it, if you need to do it, this is the way to do it. Um, Does that increase the <coughs> performance of pf? Or is that a well, it doesn't. Well, it will generate. Uh, it will generate a lot of traffic. <laughs> well, uh, possibly either to. Well, it will generate a lot of data that will go to your local hard disk or over the network to your log host. So, depending on how well, it might actually. Well, it might be enough to to impact the uh, performance if your network is busy enough. But uh, so. But if, but if you well, really, if you only want to know know what your network is doing, if metadata is okay, well, pflow, pflow. Just a way to cover some government. Uh, here, they want to collect all this metadata for mm -hmm. uh, connections mm -hmm. for web and web connections, and mm -hmm. after this, can six months, uh, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, well, if if six months, they mm -hmm. want to. 
Yeah, well, well this one, but then again, if, 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 if you, uh, if you uh, really only want to me the metadata, you, you do not actually want the, the payload, uh, P flow, net flow. Yes, yeah, yeah, they yeah. only need the, the connection. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, the yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it, with, with, with something like this, like every, every connection would generate, generate megabytes of, of data, well, whatever, really, whatever, you, how, how much you, you, uh, you log. Uh, with uh, with PFlow, it's on the order of, I think, about 200 bytes per connection. I could be wrong, but it's not a lot more. Anyway, so uh, uh, so it will definitely take you um, take you further. And I think we already covered. Yeah, labels. We already covered. Um, and of course, well, if you well. You could you could uh, well well for, for your purposes you, you would you would be needing PFlow for uh, bandwidth um, uh, bandwidth uh, um, billing you you would possibly use something like this for the label or you could uh, probably also well you could usefully read that off PFlow as well so um, and yes there are a number of strange ways to uh, generate your la label names but anyway the labels are generated at start at rules at load so uh, all these <coughs> some of these uh, um, uh, uh, variables are a little less uh, interesting than they actually seem um, And yes, uh, here we have again sysnet states that we looked at in the uh, yeah yeah that, yeah that's that's another one, and of course if you really want to look at well again nice graphs for your um, for your uh, for your bosses uh, PF stack still works it was broken briefly after uh, uh, after the uh, new Q. Uh, <laughs> But it, it's, it, it now works again, uh, and yeah, you can see, you can tell this, this is all an old slide by, by the date here. But it's basically install a package. Uh, the um, example config file is actually quite usable, and you just muck around with it and see, pick your colors. Yeah, it's, it works. Um, We have uh, yeah. Um, well, logging logging is definitely some, something you should uh, be looking into, uh, and. Um, I might actually come back with TCP then as your friend. Uh, that's, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I haven't. I, yes. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, a lot of things have happened recently. Uh, do we have any? Well, back to the propaganda then. Um, you want to tra transition from old queue to priorities and queues, and um, yes, this is basically it. Um, anyone else wants coffee? <laughs> if that's it, we're going to um, one last uh, one last request from this side is. If you enjoy, if you enjoyed this session, if you enjoyed this session, uh, the best way to support OpenBSD is to send them money. You can some, get some items back, such as CD sets, T-shirts. Uh, distribution is changing, so the old site may or may not be sold out. There will be a new one. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, well, anyway, uh, Alston is retiring. Yes. Uh, and he's served us for 20 years? 20 years. Yeah, something like that. So Alston is a great guy, but he's finally stayed up enough, uh, up enough to buy a buy himself a farm to retire to somewhere in Alberta. And uh, yeah, we wish him well also. But anyway, please buy Open Beasties stuff or just send them a donation. Grab your boss's credit card and send, <laughs> send, <laughs> and, have, and buy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but then again, if if you want, <laughs> well, but then again, if you, if your uh, if your boss wants to um, uh, have the proper uh, uh, the proper. Um, uh, uh, paper mill, you can do, well, at least for North, North American organizations, the Open BSD Foundation is a Canadian non nonprofit that will accept, uh, accept donations and will supply the paperwork required. I am not quite sure how that works for European corpora corporations. Uh, well, anyway, you can, you will, if you ask them, they will give you the paper, uh, lots of paperwork to, to make the tax man happy or so forth. Um, it's also possible, well, anyway, the best way to make sure uh, PF and OpenBSD stays uh, available and stays good is to send money to the OpenBSD project. Uh, if you want to support me, on the other hand, the uh, best way is to buy the book. And you already, uh, the, not the second edition, the third edition. Um, um, anyway, uh, but there's, and if, you, if you're quick, Really quick, um, go to uh, the BSD Sophia. Uh, Forty percent off will be. Uh, it will live at least for for this conference and probably a few days more, but not a lot longer. Um, and it's it's been live for two weeks already, and I I haven't checked it checked if anybody have figured out how to use it yet, but <laughs> you can. Now, well, this is our this is our secret. I will be showing it in my session tomorrow as well. Uh, and anybody who wants to buy the book for forty percent off, welcome. Um, I had planned, hoped for having uh, physical copies available here. Unfortunately, they're still being printed somewhere in North America. Um, I later I heard was it, yeah, well, they would probably be shipping them just after the conference. So. But anyway, anyway, if you uh, if you catch up with me at some some later point uh, with a book I've written, I will sign it for you. <laughs> so, right, uh, and I think we're possibly a little early for lunch, but we will have coffee, I guess. So, so I'm still here for questions, but <laughs> if we're okay, we're yeah, right. Anyway, thanks thanks for showing up. <laughs> <laughs>